but my first years I was very much involved in research data in the sciences. Although you can say that the clear distinction between science and humanity is something very Anglo-American. I'm a German, so in Germany we have Wissenschaft, which uh, I don't know how it is in, in Polish, but for us Wissenschaft is everything. It's something we, we create knowledge and we don't distinguish that sharply between science and humanities. So um, when I came to, to Göttingen and learned that there is a big difference between humanities, I was uh, astounded. So I would like to show you some examples from the sciences because actually the fact is that if you look at research data, the sciences have some longer tradition and some longer experience in working with research data. And I would like to show and share some of these experiences. Um, it was already mentioned, the science paradigms. You might have heard it before. It's from the late John, uh, Jim Gray from Microsoft Research. He introduced this in a talk probably 10 years ago before he disappeared at sea. And um, the basic idea is that 1,000 years ago, um, Science was empirical, the people were actually looking at things, they were watching how the seasons changed, they were watching how birds fly and then they wrote it down and they were just observing it. And in the last few hundred years what actually came stronger was the theoretical branch. So the idea that I'm observing things but I want to understand what is the theory behind it. So people were starting making theories and um, questioning to understand what actually was happening. And then interestingly, um, although people were trying to test their series always, um, due to the rise of computers, suddenly with the computational powers we had, <coughs> we were actually able to simulate things. So you could observe phenomena, you could make a theory about it, and then you can start to simulate it and see if what you see in your simulation behaves the same way as what you are seeing in nature. And the so-called fourth paradigm now is e-science, where e-science stands for enhanced science. So actually, with this new computer technologies, new hardware, um, new approach, we now unify theory, uh, experiment, and simulation all together in one with our machines, and we create a lot of data with it. So the question is, what type of consequence does this have to, to us as scientists, as librarians, as funders, as professors? Well, scientific information nowadays is more than just an article or a book. If you look back at this, the history of scientific information, for, for centuries scientific information was starting from letters and then the letters became journals and journals became books. So that is actually how scientific information was shared and published. But it's now much more than this. Scientific information is a picture, a video, a blog post, um, a, a, a tweet, um, uh, data sets, something you, 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 you draw about, um, um, a mind map. So any kind of this can be scientific information that actually is worth being published and being shared. So all our researchers and we as stakeholders should actually open our workflows to all this kind of information because all of this is worth being shared worth being published, worth being cited, and can motivate ongoing research. I work in the, also in the Codata XD task group on data citation, and we uh, published a report in 2013, and in this we said, um, comparing scholarly publishing with data, if publications are the stars and planets of the scientific universe, data are the dark matter, influential but largely, largely unobserved in our mapping process. And there's something true to that and also there is a big challenge and a big opportunity for us to do something against that. Of course the general question is when you talk about data what are we talking about and we have different examples of classical map, weather maps, we have pictures, we have uh, Marie Curie's notebook, um, we have genomes and so actually data can have a lot of different manifestations and I will show you some more examples but generally <coughs> when we talk of data we talk of any output of a scientific process that is worthy of being published and worthy of being shared and can motivate people for, for ongoing research. So I would like to show you some examples of what has happened in the sciences in the last 10 years when I was working in this area 
And one, one first example, of course, is that data sets now can be found in library catalogs. It's something that started 10 years ago, and I had the pleasure to be part of that from the beginning. So that's a screenshot from the library catalog of the Technical Library in Germany. And there's a screenshot, but also a link. Let me see if I can find the mouse. There it is. So if you click on this, then we go to the library catalog. And I can switch it to English, probably. That's nicer. And that's a classical catalog entry with catalog information, an abstract, some more information, some similar related documents. But actually, it's a data set. So data sets now can be part of the library catalogs. People can publish their data, and people can access the data through library catalogs. And of course, citation of data, reuse of data is a, is a big motivation for scientists to share their data. Because if they can share their data and other people cite it, they get recognition for that. But I will come back to that later. Um, we have nice things that suddenly um, we start to visualize things in a different way. That's an example of um, the Cambridge Chemical Institute. Um, when we started working with different disciplines, we found out that um, some disciplines are far ahead than others. And especially um, crystallography is something that is very far ahead. Because in crystallography, it is common that data sets have to be published. So for over 50, 50 years now, uh, when you make a thesis in crystallography and you create a new crystal, it's part of the obligation that you have to deposit the data set behind the crystal structure either in Cambridge or in Karlsruhe. That's one of those data sets that belongs to a thesis. And you can see what's nice about it. There's a 3D viewer. So suddenly you can publish this data, like you would publish an article. But it's, it's only the data. It's not the article describing the data. And also there's a 3D viewer, the chemical diagram. So there's additional information attached to that that help you understand the data better or reuse it better. Um, what type of data? I'm, I'm, I was referring to that actually anything can be of interest to us and we, when we talk of publishing uh, data. And um, I have added some examples here. And you see all of them have a DOI as a uh, persistent identifier. That actually was the basic idea we had 10 years ago, that we wanted to publish any kind of data with a DOI as an independent published object. So an article has a DOI and a data set has a DOI. I will not go into much details to that. But you can see all of these are referenced because they have a DUI. And what we have here is um, photo. So that's a seabed photo. I, and you can see that actually this is a data set. So it has um, different photos. These are the places where the pictures were taken. And um, whoops, now I wanted to go here. And then you can actually, I think you can even look at the pictures. If you go to, oh, that's, yeah, that, these are the different uh, links to the images. So let me just open one of them and see if it works. Yeah. So these are actually the, the, the seabed photos. So what we just seen was a catalog entry of a class of seabed pictures that were independent published as data. Because, of course, seabed photos can motivate new research. They were taken by scientists. so. Other people can cite it, can reuse them, and can make write articles about it, and can cite the original um, author. But also, something that's very nice and probably hard to um, see is uh, that one. That's an audio file. Um, and the interesting thing is that that actually is a singing iceberg. I'm not quite sure if we have, if we can hear something. Probably not, but uh, that actually was a, was a recording done by. Um, oh, I can hear it. That's an iceberg singing because the, they found out that if the wind is going over icebergs, the icebergs make a sound, and that's what you can hear in the background. Okay, that that, that was a singing iceberg. But that, but actually, that's also scientific data, because somebody recorded that, and other people can reuse it, and reuse it for other different disciplines. So that's another example. Um, I will skip some of them, but you can see that any type of information that scientists were recording, were collecting, can be published and can be reused, and is, is worthy. Um, which brings us to another problem. 
If we all have all these different types of information in our catalog and make it available for scientists, we of course need to change our ways of looking for content. That's, I have a library background that was, I was working in the last 10 years with the idea of if, if we have things like um, 3D models in our catalog, and the library I was working for before I came to Göttingen also is the German Library of Architecture. So the idea was that we put architectural models in our library catalog and um, CD um, um, CAD files. And the idea was how can we search for them? And there was a, I'm just skipping through this. So the general idea was that how can, how can we describe architectural models in a, in a um, uh, how can we extract the semantics about this model and how can we start uh, making searches for them by sketching and saying that I want to look for uh, a, a, a model of a house and the house has a floor and five rooms attached to that and, and, and things like that. So that was a way to make um, new kind of searches possible for new kind of content. Chemical search, of course, is very common. So you, the idea is that you have a chemical compound, chemical structure, and you can draw this in a way that every chemist knows, every chemist knows all these tools, how to draw some chemical structures. And the idea is that in the library catalog, you draw the structure and then you make a query and outcome as a result, all documents that have this chemical structure in them. And also, um, when we talk of data sets as uh, classical curves, the idea is if I have a data set that has a time line and some behavior over time, can I query by making a, a graph that of the, uh, what I like to have? And we had a pro project with that with the Fraunhofer Institute. And actually what came out of it was the possibility that you make a query by sketch. So you, make a, you draw a curve and then you browse through all the data sets and out comes this. And that actually is a, is a um, every picture is a family of data sets that have the similar pattern. And the darker it is, the more closely it is to what you were actually drawing. And then you click on that and it gives you a, a, a number of data sets that have the same behavior. That was a prototype project, but very interesting. Another example, um, video files. Of course, um, we have audiovisual material in our catalogs. A lot of libraries started. And the thing is, if you have videos how can you index them? What type of cataloging do you need for that? And what you can see is actually that through the timeline of the video, there are different um, keywords that appear in the video, and they appear also here. So you can click on them and then jump into the video at the time frame where actually this keyword was, measured, was mentioned. So that's a new way of indexing. You, uh, you take the uh, video, you extract the spoken words, you look for keywords, and then you make direct links to, to, the, to the video. So these are all new tools, new ways of publishing content, searching for content, classifying content, indexing content. Um, another example that I just have to mention because it was part of the work I did in the last 10 years, of course, is data citation. So um, I was mentioning why do we do this? Um, we want to make the world better. We want to give more access to different types of content. How can we persuade the scientists to publish their data? Well, it's tricky. Um, generally, of course, the scientists do science because they want to make the world a better place. But also, they have their liabilities with their danger offices, and they need to have some credits, some citations, some, um, some, some uh, awards, rewards. And of course, citation is interesting for them because scientific success, success is measured in citation. So the idea was make data citable. And that's a brilliant example because that is a citation of a data set. That's in the catalog. And that's a citation of an article. And this data actually belongs to that article, is used in this article. And what is so nice about this, if you click on the DOI of the article, and then you go to Elsevier Science Direct page, and you can see, take some time to, to load up. Um, I'm not quite sure, uh, but I think we have access to the article probably because we are here in the library. Look at that. Yes, we have access to the complete article. But uh, the thing is actually, if we were not in the library, if you would resolve the DUI, you would only see the abstract and a purchase button saying that you have to pay 39.99 to actually access this article. But if you look also to, to the right, you see there is this picture saying um, related data, telling you that there actually is underlying data to this article. And if you click on this, 
then you actually go to the data set that's underlying of this article. And the nice thing that I can't show you now is that the access to the data is open. So actually, even from the Elsevier Science Direct page, you have not access, even if you don't have access to the article, because you have to pay for that, the link to the data is visible, and you can click on that, and you have access to the data, because the data is free. I can show you, because this is, the page tells me this data set has six subsets, and if I click on one of them, it gives me some more information on the metadata, and if I click on that, I can actually access, I can download the data, or I can access the data, and this is the data set. So the data is open and free, and if you click on um, download the data, you can actually reuse it and put it into your own uh, infrastructure and, and, and tools. Uh, well, that was good. okay. Um, two other examples, how I, oh, I'm, I'm very good time-wise. Um, two other examples, of course, um, the Higgs, Higgs particle. So when CERN discovered the uh, existence of the Higgs particle, of course, they published a data set, and the data set is citable. And, um, and the lower example is something that I like very much. Um, I don't know if you recall, but in 2011, there was an E. coli outbreak in Germany. People were dying from E. coli, and nobody knew where this E. coli came from. So our colleagues in Beijing at the Beijing Genomic Institute thought they would like to make a genome sequencing of this E. coli to find out where it comes from. And the classical way what they would have done was um, they would have made a genome sequencing and at the end they would write a Nature article about this and put the genome sequencing data as supplementary to the article and it would appear in Nature half a year later. But instead what they did was they announced that they want to make the genome sequencing and they created a GitHub page. I don't know how many of you know what GitHub is, but GitHub is a platform where, where computer scientists or uh, hackers share their code and share what they're doing and people can access it and um, take the code and do things uh, they want to do with that on their own. So they created a GitHub page and published every little step of their um, process. And people could annotate it, give commands, could use the code, uh, the, the data in a different way. And at the end, they finally made the genome sequencing of the E. coli. And instead of giving it, writing a Nature article, they immediately published the genome sequencing the moment it was done and tested and ready. And thus helping scientists in Germany, in Hamburg and in Münster to identify the E. coli and cure the, the and, and stop the outbreak because then people were able to identify the E. coli. So that's an example of, um, of what I say is e-science, because first of all, the general process, what happened was that they shared all their steps with the community and get some feedback from the community. They published the data independently from the article and thus helping stopping an end to the outbreak. So we have a new way of science, a new way of scientific publication, making, uh, giving better results at the end. So that was my experience of the last 10 years in, in science. So what's the situation for the digital humanities? Um, another example of research data, and there are a lot of them out there, uh, from Christian Borgman, representations of observation objects or others, entities used as evidence of phenomena for the purpose of research or scholarships. Or generally, as I said, anything that is the output of any scientific progress and you would like to share it and you would like to share it with people and you believe other people could use it or we use it. And if you look back at all the use cases I've shown you from the sciences, uh, there were a lot of similar use cases in the humanities because the general idea of having new catalog entries, publishing all this new type of content is very similar. If you think of what is research data in the humanities, then we have a lot of different type of things. Of course, we have the text corpora that we like to have. We have some additional data about the text corpora, some different pictures about this, some different statistical graphs. and. Um, most of them are also worth sharing and worth publishing and, um, and belong into catalogs. So we have to think the same way as we thought in the sciences. Also, linking with articles. If you write an article about your research in the humanities and you have underlying data, things that you did, you spent your PhD, your last five months on this, creating this special kind of content, and you write an article about it, then of course you would like to link the article to this type of content. And of course, if we have research data from the humanities in our catalog, if we 
browse for them. We need new type of, of search tools. We need to, to look for content in a different way than the classical bibliographical um, uh, catalog record in the library and extend, extend our search strategies. Um, in, uh, in Gutting, we do a lot with uh, digital editions, and this, most of the times, this is a classical data set from the humanities, because you actually work with text corpora. Um, but there is more than meets the eye. Of course, you need to make a, um, probably convert this into more easier readable fonts. That's one, one step that you do. But then you have probably links to historical places that you would like to visualize. So you probably need a link to, to, a, uh, to a map, something like that. So you have links to other digital objects. So you would like to show that actually how this document is related to other places, people, documents, especially people. So you have probably people popping up into your document. And it would be nice to make a link to some sort of family tree or some other sort of relations between the people. So there is a lot of additional information that you would like to visualize just by looking at your classical documents. And that actually is a strength and something where, what I learned, where the humanities are in a better position as the sciences, you wouldn't believe. Um, most of the examples I've shown you from the scientists are based on bilateral projects between one data center and a publisher, between one data center and a community, or between data site, the uh, organization that I, I was head of for five years, and, and different data centers. And the humanities, I learned, um, there is a much stronger working in the community, and there's a much stronger sharing of tools and sharing of methods. And that's something that is unique, and that's something that is very rare to find in the sciences. In the sciences, most of the scientists work on their own, and they have their own tool for their own purpose. And what I learned that in the humanities, there's a big movement towards sharing of tools and using and having um, joint uh, infrastructures. That's an example of DARIA. There is a European DARIA and there's also the German DARIA. DARIA is a network of organizations that work together in the humanities. And that's a, just a small graph of what DARIA in Germany is doing. So we're, we're providing... Um, oops. Um, we have a lot of um, infrastructure elements, a lot of, um, of tools that help people create data, they help people annotate data, they help storing data, making it available. We have a lot of teaching. Because the one thing, humanities are, are, are better off in a way because they have this general more sharing attitude in their community, as I experienced. But the one thing that, of course, is a lot different than the sciences is that the content is so heterogeneous, uh, much more heterogeneous than, than in, in the sciences. So you need much more training, you need much more um, advice giving in, in the process of making data available in the humanities than you have in the sciences. So that's also a big part. But outcomes are, are tools. So that's actually is an example of, of a text image link editor in TextGrid, which helps you to have a classical document, and then you cre can create a TEI file out of that. And you can actually link the images of the scans you have to the, to the text itself, and you can identify which version appears in which which part of, of the image, and that helps you, of course, to, to reuse this text. And these are tools that are used and, and, and developed through the DARIA infrastructure, and are used globally. Well, well a lot of, of course, a lot of scientists in Germany uh, use them, and also scientists around U uh, Europe. And that, of course, helps us to, to make the content available to share it, because we use the same tools for that. And um, then you have, uh, of course, uh, repositories, and um, that's, that's something that I'd like to show you, um, an additional tool based on that, yeah. the geo browser. So the idea behind that was to visualize geographic information based on text, so you can take one text corpora into that and try to visualize all the places that I mentioned in this text. And this is another example where people were just looking at the library catalog of Göttingen, at all the records in there, and looking at all the works there that are either from or about Schiller and Goethe, and then visualize where these works were published. And, um, and through over time, and also um, geographically. And that is also a nice tool to help you to put geographic information um, as a visualization of your, your, your content. So I, I understand that I'm asking a lot. Because I, um, 
I want to encourage you that um, we have a growth of information. Um, when I tell you that do you no longer just look at the articles and the books, but also look at the data sets, the pictures, the videos, the blog posts, the tweets, um, the, the, the anything that the scientists are doing. Um, and also that look at diversity of media types. Not only classical PDF documents or Word documents or just textual documents, but, but any kind of output that is shared and, and public content types that we don't even know of that might pop up just in the next years. And all of this is worth of sharing and handling and storing in data centers. <coughs> and I haven't even mentioned the science to zero aspect of it, that if you share this content, wouldn't it be great if other people could comment on that, link it with other objects, give, weight it somehow, give, give some sort of, um, make, make their own things with it, that's what all this science to zero about it. And people might say that actually that is the classical big wave that also the commission is talking about. And um, uh, is it a threat? Probably not. Um, because information overload um, is a problem for manual creation. Um, of course, if you act like a 20th century scientist or a 20th century library and say that I want to read all this content and I want to make my notes about this and I want to catalog, catalog it in a classical way, then of course you're lost with all this diversity of information and overload. But is Google, is Google complaining about the data deluge? No, because Google likes to get more and more data because the more data they get, the better their, their filters get. And that's actually a thing is that um, we are here to create tools, maintain tools that help us working with that. And these can include, any, these can include automatic indexing of continent or, or automatic classification tools to create data, um, artificial intelligence tools to help us um, cataloging things. And actually that is a, um, a task that's worthy of a big community and something that we cannot do on our own, but we have to work in a bigger community to actually create these tools and test them and work together with the scientists. So we don't have to turn off the taps, but build boats. Because all this is not only a challenge, but it's an opportunity. Because as, I, as I've shown, um, the fact of open data, that you can actually publish data, make it available, share it with other scientists without any commercial publisher being involved, is a radical step for a scientist, that he suddenly is in power of his publications. Um, the fact that you can actually spend all your time creating tiny bits of content that um, you will never write a nature article about it, but you create these tiny bits of content and then you publish them and other people reuse them and cite you and you get scientific recognition for all these tiny things that you were doing is a, is a vast new step for, for your career because you can suddenly get scientific reward and equi 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 uh, cre uh, credits for things that you wouldn't have got credit for 10 years ago. So I believe we should all ride this wave together. So thank you very much.